a couple of weeks ago, the family of the incident in 2000. And I'm paraphrasing, but it goes something like this. While Ray Lewis is being celebrated by millions, two men tragically and brutally died in Atlanta. Ray Lewis knows more than Ray Lewis ever shared. What would you like to say to the families? It's simple, you know. God has never made a mistake. That's just who he is, you see? And if our system, this is the sad thing about our system. If our system took the time to really investigate what happened 13 years ago, maybe they would have got to the bottom line truth. But the saddest thing ever was that a man looked me in my face and told me, we know you didn't do this, but you going down for it anyway. To the family, if you knew, if you really knew the way God works, he don't use people who commits anything like that for his glory. No way. It's the total opposite. Ray Lewis, by most accounts, is one of the greatest middle linebackers and leaders in the history of the NFL. His list of achievements in the league are truly remarkable. From two Super Bowl titles, one Super Bowl MVP, 13 Pro Bowl selections, and two Defensive Player of the Year awards, Ray Lewis throughout his career has been simply put, dominant and Ray would always make his presence felt on the field. Whether it be his iconic entrance onto the gridiron or his pre-game speech, Ray would always make receivers and running backs think twice about ever going down the middle. During his 17-year career with the Baltimore Ravens, Lewis amassed over 2,000 tackles, 41 and a half sacks, and 31 interceptions. However, this incredible career almost never came to be, and we're going to turn the clock back over 20 years to the tragic event that occurred on January 31st, 2000 in Atlanta, Georgia. Super Bowl 34 was hosted in Atlanta and this was a close encounter between the Tennessee Titans and St. Louis Rams in an epic final ending that saw the Titans come up just short of a miraculous comeback. And the events that proceeded after the game is where we're going to take a look at. In the week leading to the Super Bowl, Ray Lewis and his entourage would travel to Atlanta to enjoy the Super Bowl festivities and to attend an after party at Cobalt Lounge. This was pretty customary as the Super Bowl always attracted many athletes and celebrities across the nation. This was the most televised annual event in the US, so for much of the week, there were plenty of parties to go around. That being said, following the game and into the wee hours of the next morning, when leaving the club at 4am, an altercation broke out between Lewis's camp and another group. According to witnesses, during the verbal heated exchange, a man in Lewis's group was struck in the head with a champagne bottle, and that's when things got really physical as punches started to be exchanged between the two groups. During the fight, two men, Richard Lawler and Jason Baker, were stabbed in the heart and bled to death. As a result, Lewis and his two companions, Reginald Oakley and Joseph Sweeting, along with seven others, hopped in their limousine and sped off. And while driving away, shots were fired from Marlon Bros, a friend of Lawler and Baker. During police questioning, there were a lot of witnesses where one even stated that they saw a passenger from the limo dump a white hotel laundry bag in a dumpster outside a fast food restaurant. Another would testify that they saw a passenger exit the car and walk towards a trash can but was holding a brown paper bag. So this led many to speculate that someone from Lewis's camp may have tossed away incriminating evidence. Later on, Atlanta police detective Ken Allen would find a small folding knife on the ground near the bodies. The knife found at the scene did not contain any fingerprints or DNA, however investigators traced the knife they found back to a sporting goods store where Ray Lewis was signing autographs the day before the big game, and the linebacker's signature and telephone number were later found on the receipt. This was not a good look because what appeared to have been the murder weapon was now directly linked back to Lewis. And now things were going to take a turn for the worse as upon speaking with authorities, Ray provided misleading information to police about the identity of the two other men he was with in the limo and that he was never at the scene where the murders took place. Three days after the incident, Lewis and his two companions were charged for murder and aggravated assault with warrants being issued for both Reginald Oakley of Baltimore and Joseph Sweeting of Miami. Two days later, both accused individuals would turn themselves into police custody and the jury selection process would begin. During the selection, a jury of nine black women, one black man, and a white woman and a white man would be chosen. 
At the trial proceedings, one of the witnesses, Evelyn Sparks, who was a college student riding in Ray Lewis's limo along with three other witnesses, all testified that Lewis was not the aggressor in the brawl. The prosecution would only have one witness who confirmed that the football player actively participated in the fight. District Attorney Paul Howard then planned on putting his star witness, Lewis's limousine driver Dwayne Fassett, on the stand. However, once on the stand, inconsistencies started to arise between a statement and testimony. Initially, the driver's statement confirmed that all three were fighting with the defendants and that Oakley and Sweeting had stabbed the two victims. However, during his testimony, Fassett said he saw Lewis raise his hands during the brawl but never saw him strike anyone and that he heard Lewis telling his friends to stop fighting and get into the vehicle. Throughout the next few days of the trial, many witnesses would take the stand but would provide many different accounts as to what occurred on that tragic evening. As a result, the fact that the prosecution was unable to recover the blood-stained suit Lewis was wearing and the multiple accounts of what actually happened that night, it seems as though they didn't have much of a case against the football player. However, in a shocking turn of events, Lewis's attorneys Don Samuel and Ed Garland would then negotiate a plea agreement with the district attorney where murder charges against his client would be dropped in exchange for his testimony against Oakley and Sweeting along with a guilty plea to a misdemeanor charge of obstruction of justice. Subsequently, Superior Court Judge Alice Bonner sentenced Ray to 12 months probation. The next day, on June 6, 2000, Lewis would take the stand and testify against his two friends. And just when you thought there couldn't be any more surprises, in a shocking turn of events, Oakley and Sweeting, who were each facing life sentences, were acquitted of both charges as the jury deliberated for less than five hours as they deemed the two were acting in self-defense. So in the end, there were two bodies and not one individual was convicted. Ray Lewis essentially struck a deal with the prosecution to pin the murders on his two friends and save himself and his football career. According to the justice system, the only crime he committed was obstruction of justice as he lied to investigators and looked to have disposed of the clothes he was wearing that night. So contrary to many beliefs that these two murders went unsolved, the fact is, is that there is no dispute that Oakley and Sweeting killed Baker and Lawler, however, this was found to be under an act of self-defense. On top of that, the prosecution did not have a strong enough case against Lewis and his companions due to the large number of people drinking that night and providing contradicting statements. The NFL would also come hard down on Lewis and slapped him with a $250,000 fine, the highest levied against a player for an infraction not involving substance abuse. In 2003 and 2004, families for both Baker and Lawler would sue Lewis for $10 and $13 million respectively. Both cases would eventually be settled out of court. And the following year, Ray Lewis was back in action in the NFL and remarkably enough, his career never took a hit. In the 2000 campaign, Ray Lewis would go on to lead the Baltimore Ravens to a Super Bowl title that was led by arguably the greatest defense of all time, followed by another title in 2013 before finally retiring. So with that said, what are your thoughts on this murder case? Did Ray Lewis benefit from his status as an athlete throughout the trial proceedings? Do you think if he stuck to his guns, he would have gotten off along with his two friends? Anyways, let me know in the comment section below, and if you enjoyed this video and want to see more of this type of content, smash that like button.